not to sound too loud, so you can have your sleep, like Clemens, for example. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Autonomous computing principles. Already too loud. Can you dim me down? This slide used to be called, or we called it, autonomy. And that is actually all most things that we are talking about. But um, as Clemens already pointed out, this is a there's a large misconception around this term autonomy, what this really means. And um, I will try to nail down some meaning of the term, coming from different angles, giving you some insights into what autonomy could possibly mean. And then we try to figure out what that means in terms of services. And why we want to do this. Gives reasons, what the advantages are, um, what the consequences are, and once again, it's just more than building web services from the run something and uh, offer it to the outside world. <coughs> One of these animated slides that I hate so much. Uh, that's me and that's my data. I myself, I have my own memory, I have my own state, my <coughs> realm of things that belong to me, only to me. And this is more or less uh, with the excess modifier private, so to speak. These are things that I maintain myself, only I myself have an idea about what they really mean. And that sometimes are of interest for somebody else, sometimes at least. And people then ask me, or that's what they better should do, unless they are able to apply some uh, device into my brain and uh, suck that information immediately from there, um, they can just ask me, and I will give them that information. I give them the information in that form that I think is reasonable. I give them information to an extent that I think that is reasonable. They still have no idea in which brain cell this data is stored, and they better should not. They just know about then my name. They know about my, my thinking, my reasoning about a certain topic, and I will express myself in a way that I choose. I cannot arbitrarily choose the way how I express things. I could just, just commence my talk in, no, I don't have that much choices, in, in German, and uh, I choose the way how to express myself, but and most of you will not understand what, the single word that I say. So there is, of course, some common understanding, and I have to agree to these understanding and conceptions of knowledge, I have to agree on that, and they have to give me some idea what they are, what they want to be. You can reach out to me, I can listen and talk, so that you can actually <coughs> talk to me. You can even send me a letter and request <coughs> information from me, or uh, that's, pre that's pretty much it. Uh, I could render then that information in English or German, I could um, write a mail again, give you that information, you can send me a letter, I send the mail back, you can call me up on the phone and I will give my information to some other guy, some other form, whatever. We talked about this in the Edge store. It remains true, of course, when we talk about this autonomy. Um, I will eventually delegate this to other people. <laughs> but this is a decision that I make myself. Nobody else can press me to do that. Uh, okay, sometimes we learn of ways how to press some people to give information, but um, let's leave that other picture here. <laughs> and this stands, I don't know these animated pictures. Um, we talked about this applying web service on top of something. That doesn't deal at all with these things that I pointed out in the first two slides. It sounds completely unrelated. This is only talking about okay, how I can talk to a service and how that talks back to the client. 
That's all it takes. Try a web service. Is that a service? We'll see that there are different qualities that we have to maintain on the service side, uh, not necessarily on the client side, um, that are necessary to form that term uh, service. I will skip that slide because it doesn't actually add anything. So, <coughs> what is it all about? We will find out dependencies between the client and the server in some way. These dependencies uh, are re rely on things that is mainly concerned with data. The message that I send to a service is data. <coughs> the answer that I get back is data too. So, how do I get to that data? And is that channeled to some way? So you can ask me, you cannot plug something into my brain. We have qualities of changing partners. Partners in a very broad sense. <coughs> Just the client and the service. The notion of, actually I have a choice. I can turn to this service or that service. I can buy my book at Amazon. I can buy it at uh, Books Online or whatever workshop, uh, bookshop there might be. In the end, for my business, ordering a book, that doesn't matter. If the way to talk to these services is exactly the same, so they are really, I can just plug that out of the picture, plug something into the picture, the same place, that's fine, but not necessary for maintaining that business. If I can't order that book online for whatever reason, maybe Amazon doesn't offer that to me, uh, I can still go to the bookshop around the corner and order that book. There is a different interoperability though, but it maintains the setup, it maintains the business. Because what are they actually, what is it all about? They are interoperable in different ways, but both they are interoperable. They can fit into a picture. That buys me then the flexibility to exchange these partners. That means, and now we are already coming closer to that, what we mean with autonomy, uh, autonomy, this block, this piece of functionality, this service, this bad word, is just one block in the whole picture. And if I take away that one, I can plug another one in there because I'm not interested in how that looks in the inside. I'm not interested in how I can talk to it. I'm not interested in how it is implemented, how it is hosted or whatever. I'm just interested in that it fulfills a certain task because that is part of the workflow that I'm modeling. That's just fine. Then I can take away that service and plug in another one. It's only possible if that thing actually encapsulates everything that it owns and only let me talk to something that it wants to expose. If it would expose more things, okay, you could say, okay, I'm just not interested in these more things. You will be tempted to do that. You will be tempted to do things, shortcutting things. You would say, okay, I could possibly get to that data immediately. I could steal the book from the shop, actually. Okay, that would violate other rules, and I might get into trouble in another, another respect. It's violating then eventually my business, because if I'm actually continuing stealing books at workshop, that doesn't work with an online, online bookshop. I can't steal with an online bookshop. I will have to pay. So that changes then the rules of business. If I'm only relying on this small, thin channel that there is towards that service, no matter how it's implemented, but only based on the task it fulfills and the way how to interact is secondary, it's still there, but it's secondary, then I have this plug and play where I all dream of something <laughs> like this. Yeah 
playing software Lego, like plugging together a larger system out of smaller pieces. <coughs> Complexity. The business that this workshop actually conducts, well, I have an idea how that really works. Um, usually, you don't have any clue about the business of that implementer of that service. You don't know that. You just know what the task it should fulfill. That's all. It should deliver a book against payment. That's it. How it does that is a secondary concern, or internal concern. If I would have to deal with that in terms of IT uh, speak, would then say, okay, how is that system built? How does the structure of their database look so I could get to that data? If that construction of their database is really weird, if it's completely nuts, if you would say, I would never build a system like that, okay, I have to deal with it because I have to get to the data. You don't have to deal with it. If you're just asking a question towards some edge of that service, which is not the database, and then getting your information from there. You don't have to look at their architecture. You're not interested in their architecture. They could change every single detail within without affecting their business. Maybe they then can conduct that cheaper. Maybe they can deliver the book faster. Okay, that's a quality of service. Fine, but it doesn't really change the business. Security. Distributed apps, of course, require distributed security, or distributed roles, distributed security mechanisms. That is a facet that I will maybe not deal with it today, in order to save time. We'll talk about security tomorrow, how that works, distributed apps. Um, and then we have things like performance and scalability, the quality of service thing. How is that affected? If I, more or less, program and build my software system against a certain set of their implementation. I do that for performance reasons. That might be fine in the first place. If you look at that, if you say, okay, they own their data. I have my data here. I can now pull that da my data off my database. I pull their data getting from that service and then do all these cross joints in memory. I have to drill, get all the data from them and all the data from me. I get a huge product, which is maybe too big. Wouldn't that be fast to shortcut things and do a cross join across these two databases? Yes, that will be faster. That will be more performant. But as always, usually performance hits the scalability. It's two things, two sides of the same metal, so to speak. If you do that, you lose scalability in the sense, okay, the data has to be sitting exactly in the database. What about all that nice caching mechanism that this other service has built into it? You would bypass that completely. You cannot use it. Because you go directly to the database and not through all that caching mechanism, of course. You use that possibility to be faster on the other side. So that is always a very difficult thing to look at. Uh, I will not drill too deep into agent theory, but it's somehow related. Ever heard about agent theory? <coughs> Software agents? Yeah, a few of them, you, most likely. Um, I will not drill down into this agent theory. I will just look at what's an agent. An agent that can be a software agent, that's one thing. That can be an agent in some agency. Somebody, a person, and it never hurts if you just look at services or pieces of software like persons. Uh, so refer maybe to a service, not as an it, but as a he or a she, that helps. If you have a company and you have employees that should 
deal with certain matters. It always helps to have self-responsible and self-confident and independently working people who do their jobs more or less on their own. To just give a task to them, very broad way, please do this and that, and then they choose how to do that. They find their way, they know how to do this, because they have learned that at university, or at their former employer, or because they are 10 years in your company. Uh, so you don't have to give too detailed instructions. That always helps, definitely. Consider the piece of software in a similar way. So, uh, that agent is then reactive, <coughs> which actually means you give him a task, and sooner or later, he will get a response, which makes sense. And it is flexible. So, I don't have to send a whole agent script down to that service, but on your work, I just trigger functionality by a single word, and then this agent already knows what to do. And it may even, uh, in the, um, even if I, um, sorry, even able to uh, find out if this is a new task, to find out a new way to do things. It's a learning thing, a learning we have here changes based on previous experience or maybe just by any heuristics that it learns or however that comes. An agent is mobile. Okay, you can take it literally. Um, that is a software piece of software would then transport itself to a place where it's really able to make use of all the resources uh, that it needs. We will not talk about any, or not at least not in detail, any architecture which would implement a thing like that. So it's relatively simple to do that. In our uh, formal layout of this course, we had this uh, fabric framework, and uh, the fabric framework that was able actually to do that. Um, that employee would just say, okay, if I can't do that job here, I do that job over there. So I choose my own place where to work. I'm communicative. That is, if I can solve my problem on my own, I might pull the help of other people. And this is my own decision. I can do this myself. Or I just ask somebody else. My boss who gave me the job is not involved. That is, that is my decision. I go and ask somebody. My boss only expects an answer by me, not by the other guy, usually. But I have my sub-services, and I choose them myself. Temporarily continuous, OK, with employees, that is usually given. And uh, with our sense, it's a continually running process. That is this threat that is spinning by its own, asynchronously, not within that application threat itself. Goal-oriented, okay, that is then actually uh, something different that does not exactly uh, refer to what we have here. And then we have this stance autonomy, this notion, exercises control over its own actions. <laughs> That's one th sense. If that agent thinks in order to solve some problem, some other action is involved, please go ahead and do that. If that serves the purpose, fine. I'm not interested in that you do that. Yeah, thank you very much. Some other notions of autonomy, just taken from a uh, dictionary, um, and that is in politics. Um, Sam of Estonia, former member of the union of Soviet republics, uh, less independent and less autonomous at that time, gained some stance of autonomy later. And now they are actually independent from each other. They govern themselves. So they actually make decisions of their own how that is in turn 
problems are internally solved. They actually have some uh, independence in terms of how they do they do contracts and negotiations with other parties, other autonomous <coughs> units. And nobody's involved with that business. Um, a few years later, uh, Estonia gave up parts of their autonomy then again when joining the EU and last year. So there's always levels of autonomy. Some pieces are really completely autonomous, others you just delegate them to others. In a philosophical sense, um, existence as independent moral agent, I think this is just for completeness here, but more in, uh, interesting is this stance of independence of a text in literature. An autonomous text can be understood without that you know, without knowing that the author actually had, uh, has had a bad youth and was beaten up by his father every day. Then you understand the text. If you don't have to have that knowledge, but just read the text as it stands without any additional um, situational description that this is an autonomous text. This is closer to what we have here. If I send a message somewhere, if I send a book order somewhere to a service, that service doesn't need to know what I'm actually currently doing. It doesn't need to know that this is going to be a Christmas gift. It doesn't need to know whether they, I want to just buy this book and uh, because I want to, I'm the author and I want to get get up all the uh, the sales rate or whatever in order to send me the book. It's not that autonomous again. Therefore, you don't have to have uh, a this with Amazon. You can check those little uh, checkbox which says. Please wrap that as a gift. And this is a more circumstance information, additional information that you need here in order to fulfill then the task. Boundaries and autonomy. Now, if you're talking about independent states, of course, that's related. That's related to software too. Really have to know which code and especially which data belongs inside the service and which not. This explicitness of boundaries, not only with crossing boundaries in terms of doing this recall to the service, but also this is data that I can only reach going through that service border, or this is data that is hidden from me. Two services should always be independent from each other in the sense of they can be recoded, redeployed, and even completely replaced. I already mentioned that. Recoded, redeployed, coming back to that versioning thing. Sometimes <laughs> only just new versions, not that I just completely change my business logic here or just change one business partner with another. I just have a new version of a piece of code. That's also recoding so in this sense. It can even be that I have two services in place, in the sense of our service autonomous pieces, that are developed by two groups in your development team, independent groups, sub teams. They can go at different paces. One delivers a new version, the other doesn't have to need, uh, deliver a new version. One team is actually working on something and trying to fix the bug. And then the update comes back at some point in time. But you're going to have already a testing phase for, all the other, for the rest. If all things are autonomous, that leaves you with the option of working with an old version soon until the new version is available, working with mock-up objects, just the original service is not yet done. I just have a mock-up. Because I'm only talking to a certain interface, not going any in the implementation dependent way around that border. I can easily do that. 
So I can do integration tests before all parts are actually ready. Kevin's already mentioned the notion of fiefdoms and emissaries. A fiefdom is something which is completely independent from each other. That is, you can't get into it. You only can send a message into that, in an emissary. There's no way of going into that fiefdom. That's strictly closed to you. Still, at least the message has to go into you, into that fiefdom. So, what do you want to accept? For which kind of messages do you open the door of your fiefdom? Or a fortress? In a sense. So, you have to have some kind of trust in between the client and the service. Usually trust is something that the service, the quality of the service, not of the client. The service has to trust its client that is not misused. The client's notion of trust is something completely different. I will send a message somewhere and I trust that service that will actually perform the action that I requested. Since that's a completely independent piece of software, I have no direct control what that thing does. It just does just the opposite. Okay, I'm, I'm host. The gray area between just functional calls and a service in the black sense. There's something in between, and we are very accustomed to that, that is building components. They offer their interfaces, and you only talk to these components using their interfaces. And you don't get to the private data of a component. That's pretty much known. What does do services actually add? They add not only the private data within these objects, which are still in a service, <coughs> and it's not only that we talk to the services using messages, you could also talk to the components using messages, doesn't make any difference. But I have my database as part of the service itself, considered really part of the service. The component is sitting on a database. And all the components of the software system sits on, on the same database. And I've put a lot of effort in formulating interfaces for the components and make clear this is private uh, data in the objects and this is public data in the objects that you can get to. And then I have underneath this big database, one for all, and this is another interface to the data. Just one. The, the general interface. It's not even really strictly typed, so to speak which actually renders all that efforts that I put into that restrictions here as completely useless. Services shall be autonomous, and that means we own the data. And supporting that, we should implement it like this. We have our own data, and nobody has any way to get to the data. If I put the data of two services into one database, I've already made a slight mistake. I can, usually, we have one database instance underneath the whole application, even if several services that I, we, we would think are services are working on top of that data. Actually, there's no need to do that. It would be very helpful to have several instances of a database for each service one. Or maybe even more than one for a service, but don't share an instance across services. Because it's so easy just to do that cross join across that data domains within a single database. Travis and me we worked on this software system which was uh, it grew very large in the end, it's something like two and a half million lines of code, uh, cranked out by four people in one year. And something like 350 database tables, uh, 300 objects working on that, quite a big system. And then the team grew. Up to 20 people were working on that later on. And 
As long as we were four people, we stick exactly to the rules. These are the data tables that belong to that partner database, the address database of partners. These are the data tables that belong to the key value system. These are the databases that belong to the calculation of uh, interest rates and so on. Strictly separated. And then, at one point in time, when all these new guys come in, uh, I think we haven't made it too clear, well, obviously not, but clear enough at least, uh, that these things should stay independent from each other and don't do all these cross joints. It's faster to do a cross joint just using, for example, the key tables, um, than just pulling data from here and then from there and joining that to get all together. Problem. When developing such a system, you do that more shooting at a moving target. That is, you have 350 database tables, and uh, we had, at that time, we had these big printers, these big laser, laser printers, that high from the, from the floor, and uh, we're getting very hot. You don't want to sit close to it. And we printed that database model, and if you want to find out whether this is really still actual, you just have to feel the temperature of the paper. If it's cold, you can throw it away. That was the dynamics of that system. Um, that means somebody changed something in his tables, or even split it up, normalized things, or denormalized things. That's what people do all the time. And if I have to do my cross joints, and one of the other guys who was responsible at least nominal responsible for that table, changed now the form of that table, or added something, or renamed the column, my code broke. So that doesn't work. If you would have put that into several instances of databases, at least at development time, what you do afterwards doesn't matter. But if at development time you put that in different database instances, that can't happen. Very helpful to do that. So they shall not have any state shared with others. They should stay completely independent. Not even of in-memory state. Not, it doesn't necessarily uh, here relate to databases in the database sets like SQL Server or Oracle. If they have multiple instances of the very same service, they should not share anything. Just in order to avoid bottlenecks. Why do I do multiple instances of a service? To do more work at the same time. Well, then I have one shared instance and one bottleneck again. So, what's the deal? And no other communication beside all that explicit communication through that edges that we already said. No cross joints, no shortcuts, getting to an object, obtaining a pointer, a reference to any object, and use it directly. If that is in a different process, that already helps because then you can't use that pointer. Two services working together. One service pulls <laughs> or st has stored some data in that database, and of course, he does that using some primary key. And he keeps that as the reference to that data. And then, for example, you use the customer number as the primary key of that data. And then you pass that customer number to some other service. And since this is the primary key, that service could then go by, to the database by himself and pull that data out of the database using that token. Um, I think that looks familiar. We do that all the time, most likely. Mm -hmm. That's bad. Because you already have an implementation detail made public. That is the primary key. That's an implementation detail. Nobody should ever have a primary key besides myself. If I would just change the, uh, my data store, to a different format, or I just come up with a new way to index things, so I do, 
you choose the customer number as the primary key, something different now. That service now has a problem. It tries to turn to a database using that token and it doesn't work. So, oops. What you should, should, do, should have done in the first place here is pass data, only the data of that, what is stored here, not the uh, primary key. And nothing that ever serves as a primary key. Use an artificial key in the database that only makes sense to you, whatever that might be, and make that, and give that never ever out to somebody else because that might use, that guy might then use it and turn to the database by itself. Is data inside and outside of the service? Data outside, these are the messages. They are only stored in messages. And there's data inside of the service that usually stored in the database. Data in the, in the, on the inside of a service that might change. Data on the outside of the service never changes. You just instantiate that data. You pull the customer's data from a database, and as soon as you have done that, that's independent from the database. And you send that around. And it should remain stable. It will not be updated if anybody updates the database. Since there's no connection. You send that out somewhere. That data might be gotten stale or unusable. The problem that you have is every time that you go back to the database, you have to make sure that the data in the message still makes any sense. We'll talk about locking into the, da in the, in the database. That's what you usually do when you say, okay, I give something out to you and I make sure that it will be consistent with what my data store is and I put a lock on that data, uh, on that data table or data row in my database. We'll never ever do that in services. We'll never know when that guy comes back that you send a message to. You don't even know that he comes back at all. You might just decide, oh, I will just now go to, uh, to lunch. That's fine, you will come back in an hour. Or just decides, no, not now, and stops his transaction completely. And then I'm sitting here with my locked data and what to do now. So you have to assume that data in the inside and data on the outside were once the same, but may deviate from each other. That's now the autonomous version of that other thing. Just pass the data, never expose any pass to the data. So don't give that client service here any reason that it might be successful to use that token to get to the data by itself. Somehow that one word, there is a slide missing. Ah, no, not missing, it's there. Autonomous service requests to multitude to several instances of a service. And these then actually access a shared cache, which is in front of that database. Common scenario. You have only one instance that doesn't pose any problems. If you have two instances, it's still no problem. You just talk to that shared cache. But now, you want to don't have uh, you have more than these two instances, but that requires you to put these instances on more than one machine. Because a single machine is not able to drive more than two instances on the service. So on a different machine, you get two more instances of that service talking to their shared data, data cache, and now these two things could possibly get incoherent. You have invented a cache. But you lose all its uh, usefulness because before you can now write to the database or get data back, back from the database, you have to make sure that it's still actual, what you do here, and update the other cache. 
So it gets really annoying if it, if it gets more than two servers, it gets this whole server fun. So what you would actually do, so I have to turn to this one, you would have no, would have no cache in a sense that it's just a write through cache or on, sitting on a connection to your database. No, it will be a service by itself. You introduce another bottleneck here to have a single cache which is sitting then on one particular machine of all of these. So there's a network call involved. But you get rid of all these coherency issues. So making no assumptions about any shared in memory state that I would have here gives me the opportunity to deploy my services across more than one machine. Um, this I already said, uh, mentioned, that is, instead of doing a request to service B, talking using that data contract, I can now choose another service, who has, of course, a completely different idea how to store data, and uh, because I don't rely on these data contracts, I don't care about these data contracts, I can easily perform that switch. Same thing for versioning. I can just change that data contract without being affected on the client side. Clustering. Two services sitting on one machine talking to each other. That's just fine. At some point in time, that service becomes overstressed. So I just deploy that on two machines. I have now this service sitting on that machine and the next service in that pipeline, so to speak, on the other machine. So if these two services would actually need to call upon any shared cross-service state, whatever that might be, I already have a problem. If that isn't a service, like a shared cache service, but if that is just a memory place, I have a problem. I couldn't do that. Uh, as things happen, that service will become more stressed at a certain point in time, and then I just deploy that on two separate machines, so that two instances of this service should better not have any shared state. So that's instance-specific state. Autonomy thereby enables clustering. Without autonomy, actual arbitrary clustering of services, deploying them on a server farm, isn't possible. You have to plan for that in advance. If you don't do that, you can't deploy that on the server farm. And it doesn't matter in that sense whether this is just for scaling out or just for failover clustering. It's the same thing. Because if I have shared state, most likely one of these uh, services actually encounters a problem and would have to fail over if they would share the same state. It's very likely that that other service, which should actually serve as a failover service, has the same problem. Um, that I will skip to. Having these services so separate, and each of them working on their own database, isn't that a problem when it comes to now making writing some reports about all this data. This is all the customer's data. This is all the account's data. And this is all the order data. <coughs> Sooner or later, we'll have the uh, necessity to have a report of all the orders of all the customers with their respective accounts. That's pretty much common. So what then? On one hand, since this is so separated, nicely separated between the databases, I have optimized that for the actual online transaction processing. And I think it's an unwritten law that you cannot optimize a database for both, for the online transaction processing and for the reporting. These are completely orthogonal tasks. You can either optimize for one or for the other. So it's better to optimize for the online transaction processing in the first place 
and then do that report, do that reporting in so-called offline scenario. Who really needs online reporting? For example, that report that I just mentioned. Uh, I need a report about all orders of all customers with all their respective accounts. It's complete. Why would I want to have this? That's usually something for the management to decide how they are doing or whether it's necessary to change things, whatever, or to actually come up with some provisions for their agents or their customers or whatever. It's perfectly fine to have that stated. This data is valid December 21st at 15.30. And then talk about it on the next day, or maybe an hour later. And if I need it at 15:30, I better do that report at 14:30. Nobody needs that that urgent. I don't think so. If you really do, you have completely other problems. You better think again, as you still need it. You may not think again, but there are scenarios where you need that. But then you have to make compromises anyways. Because I already said you can't optimize a database for both. For inserting all the data and updating and for reporting. They're really a compromise anyways. So the solution here is just to replicate that data out to some big database. While replicating, maybe this is not a one-to-one -one copy of tables. Maybe this is just a transforming on the fly. So while copying that data out of that database, I just make one table out of three, or three out of one, just what I need. And then I run my reports against that big database, and I have all the time to do that offline scenario. That is usually the way to go. How does it all relate to the web services thing? Um, WS can possibly demonstrate these tenets, things like boundaries, policy, schema, messages. The autonomy stance is not mentioned. This is unrelated, completely unrelated. They can apply web services to anything. We also had a customer who had the smart idea to exchange, I should exchange, yes, every single interface in his every single method on every single object in his uh, architecture with a web service. So instead of going from one room to the other, every going from one room to the other is going across the street or around the block maybe. Of course they could then do their calls using web services, but of course they do all the cross joints, they had all their uh, shared data. Uh, I could access all that private um, things using reflection, for example. I could go around all these things. Private isn't private anymore. It has never been ever programmed in C++? Having private data? Well, it's a strict uh, compile time concept. So if you have in the first header file that you ever use, define private public, uh, all those headings <coughs> go away. <laughs> Works perfectly. Um, so this is an enabling technology that is not really the solution already. But I think we have mentioned uh, stressed that actually now enough. Scenarios. 
Because if now one of these pieces here actually fails, that means that all the other pieces are sitting around and waiting for the end of, uh, end of time, more or less, but somebody will release these locks and close these transactions. There will never be something like a commit or a board because one was just involved in their transactions and decided no longer to play with you because they are autonomous, they can decide that. Maybe just for some bad reasons, maybe just for this service just died. It will never get back to you. This is a distributed system. You have to deal with a different class of problems. So this WS transaction <coughs> specification is for a very rare scenario, for a very rare scenario. The common scenario where I would actually have a business transaction where Amazon is involved and Books Online is involved, um, there will be no two-phase transactions. Even if two banks actually talk to each other, there will be no two-phase transactions. At least not spanning the, to the two banks. There are two-phase transactions, we'll talk about that tomorrow, but not spanning the banks, because they don't trust, trust each other. I wouldn't either. So, holding locks on, for, you know, on behalf of others would violate our notion of autonomy. We want to stay autonomous, or we don't want to have somebody others, other involved into our, uh, our business in that closely coupled scenario, because that would really couple things together that may not belong together. Kevin's already said, autonomous development using teams, different teams. Um, it's not very popular, popular to mention that in such an audience where developers are involved, but um, topic here, outsourcing. Uh, you have multiple companies involved in development of a system. It must not be strictly outsourcing, it can just be that two people, two companies join together in a concerted effort. And uh, that's a positive formulation of the same thing. Um, how can they possibly do that? How can they work in different time zones, loosely coupled? Not only that the resulting system is loosely coupled, but we could apply actually all those tenets like or all these tenets. Um, we have some policy in place, how we actually exchange our knowledge. Um, we are explicit of the boundaries. Yes, there's definitely an ocean between here and India. Um, there is our autonomy stance. That is a different entity, that's a different company. It is bound to some contracts, yes, but that's it. Otherwise, they do their, have their own decisions and they play their own game. They may even turn to some other business partner in the process. I don't know. So this is actually the same thing here. They are loosely coupled. They work on different paces, different management, two project managers in place, working having two different, two different completely different uh, approaches to developing software. These are C-sharp guys. These are VB guys. We know there's always an ocean in between. Asynchronicity, different time zones. Location transparency, it doesn't matter whether this company is not really in India or whether it is next door or just on the same floor but different room. Same, same things apply, same apply. Separate host is given, so to speak, and it's definitely message driven. We change everything by messages. Kind of meta thinking here, but same thing applies to the development process itself. And what is actually more natural than applying those things that actually are always applied to distributed development, apply to the results of the distributed development. So keep all those things intact on both development side and the product side, and you're better off in the end. So, 
explicit boundaries and the autonomy. Um, again. Okay. Something else, stuff. Um, the operations must be completely independent. We don't belong on any particular detail of the other side. Besides what's in the contract, besides what's in the schema. It's the only thing that we actually exchange. The only thing that we know is maintained. Again, in the contract, there's not only that syntactically enforceable part, there's always some semantics to it. And that should be maintained as well. Um, this is something we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, we'll talk about the transaction thing. How do they actually work together? Um, we have this interchangeability of operations. This one is this, but it's the next. One of these formulations of Pat Hallen. Actually, I stole this slide from Pat Hallen. Um, more or less, at least. Um, since I don't care about the inner mechanics of the service, not at all, not with any detail, I can exchange them. It's the only way to do that in the end. To make one operation as good as the next, that is, it doesn't actually matter how I work with that service. This intricacy, this detailedness of a call of working together must be avoided. It must be as simple as I send you a message and you give me an answer. Everything else makes things too complicated to build that software legal, to have that idea, this holy grail or something like a enterprise services bus. Um, actually, Kevin mentioned something that I will mention tomorrow when we talk about the service patterns. Uh, this point-to-point -point conversation. You can actually buy products implementing an enterprise service box. Um, at least it's advertised as that. Um, for example, for point-to-point -point communication or something like this. That's nice, but that keeps you away from everything, of every detail of that. That only works if I can only deal with the, with the messages. This year is different than precision. Um, that should say, I can still build a very, very detailed workflow using this mechanics. It takes the one or more message more, or a larger message. So I have to send status data, for example, traveling with the message, instead of sending properties directly into that service, bringing it into some state, and then send you a message. That doesn't work. You can still have any detail, any level of detail with that pattern. You don't lose anything. Besides maybe speed. But that's a trade-off. Um, I think that's it. I wanted to say about autonomy. As said already, this is drawing the black and drawing the white again. Usually there's something in between. But I really recommend that you should stay on the very black side, as black as possible, as autonomous as possible. Don't let anybody else interfere with your service besides going through that little hole where the message goes through. It enables all these nice things that we have, distributed development, versioning, updating, deployment, scalability. Without that, everything else is much more difficult. You gain some speed in terms of development. Sometimes it's faster. Sometimes. Particularly, in particular when you have a small team. If you have a big team, I don't think that you lose anything in terms of speed. Speed of development. You might even gain. Because you have a well-defined communication between the teams. Question. Yes. Yeah. I have two questions for you. The, I'll start with the last one. When you when you define autonomous services as customer database, as uh, invoice database, usually we don't go to the OLAP 
for a, a simple join. What you mentioned a lot of times is very simple joins that we need. We do need current data and we do need online services. Because let's, let, let me give you a simple example. A simple telecom company has a CRM system. It will need both customer and device data online. Now, when I cannot define the autonomy very clearly between these two functions. How do, how do you address that? And that's, and that's a very simple situation. Most I agree. I agree. That all comes down to another discussion that we haven't touched yet. Mm -hmm. What group of functionality should be grouped by services? Mm -hmm. So what's the granularity of services? Is there just a, a minor function that performs a task like enter customer data into the database? Is that a service by itself? Maybe not. If you actually have this close relationship between these two kinds of data, they're most likely in the same service realm. There's only one service around that. On and you better hand, should model it like this. On the other hand, you can go up in the granularity in every situation, in every new system that I have. Again, let's take the telco situation. Yeah. And uh, I have the, the device database and I have the customer database. Now I have the billing database. Are they supposed to be together? Suddenly, instead of SOA, we're back to the monolith age because everything is one service. No. Um, for example, the example that I draw is billing, or that you now get billing or reporting for the management, uh, is by definition an offline task. I agree. Um, so, this actually, there would be a in between, there would be a service edge. The other thing, where you do, if you have two services, one here and one there, sitting on this data and sitting on that data, and you do more cross joints than you do actually working with these service interfaces on top of that, um, that's most likely not two services. That's then one. This is just so closely related data. But most of the time, you don't have this. If that now is actually your, your task as an architect to formulate this data is closely related, that belongs behind one service fence. This data is closely related. This is forming a rel relative island. I agree, it's all relative. This is the gray zone. Um, I lose the one or the other join that I could possibly do. That's fine for the sake of all the advantages that I get from it. Okay. I didn't say that this is a simple task. I didn't say that this is an object cl or a class. That class corresponds to one, two, three tables in the database, and that's a service. I didn't say that. I will never say that. I just, you have to identify what's closely related and what's loosely related. And then you have to draw all these islands, all these borders. That's like a map, especially something like a map of the world. And then you're sitting on top of it and say, OK, these guys are all speaking French. I better make a board around this. Nobody can get to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, these guys, for example, they speak Chinese. They belong together. Or oh, no, then I find out that there are at least 200 versions of Chinese. and they're there is something like a main language, but not really. I have to divide it into pieces. And then I find out, OK, here are maybe the, uh, let's speak, the Scandinavians and the British. They are closely related. Uh, no matter, they have no problems talking to each other because they, they learn English primary school. And uh, that's fine. And they are closely related to each other. You don't draw borders in between. That's your task. That's architecting. Just taking a few requirements and then having more or less this one-to-one -one approach, that doesn't work. You don't need to have any experience for that. You don't have to need any domain knowledge for that. You don't have to need any technology knowledge for that. But you got to have all this knowledge for a reason. That is, finding the granularity of services is a 
very hard job. And this is the center of architecting a service-oriented system. You might end up with, if this is really everything so closely related, sorry, that's a monolith, by definition. Okay. <laughs> There's no other way to build that. If you actually hash it into pieces, you have a hard time to fit it together. Okay. That's question number one. Question number two, as states, you mentioned the fact that states should be autonomic. What happens when I need the autonomous state across yeah. machines? Why not use uh, uh, software, software or devices which share states across machines? We have in mainframe we have coupling facilities. Now we have distributed cache facilities. Why not use these? Isn't that actually the same that I draw up that I said? Okay, you talk to the very same cache and some service in place that you talk to, uh, that actually then manages distributing all that stuff. Uh, in same thing. Uh, I'm talking to a company currently, uh, Persistent Software. Uh, they build a thing like that. It's like a distributed cache for server farms. Um, that's very, very complicated to build that. And they are not really there. It doesn't really work. They have all their downsides. Some of the advantages of a cache, for example, that is faster than talking directly to the database, gets lost. Because for a single message, I now have a bunch of hundreds of update messages going around between all these cache pieces, and that eats up all the gains that I have had before. It comes down to very hard uh, analysis. Does that bring something? Does it add some performance to me? Or do I better to the solution like I picked it, depicted it, that I have an additional service? that talks to a single caching mechanism, just to have data preformative, so to speak, so I don't have to pick all the pieces from the database. Therefore, actually, the cache, this cache service that I've depicted here, um, can be an enabler to have separate entities of services working with customer and account data, having but both data aggregated in the cache already together what I need. In the database it goes to different routes again. Then it gets complicated of course, but this would be another possible approach. I don't mind. If it works in, in your scenario and it helps, <laughs> why not? But you have to be aware that you might lose other things. This, these products actually solve the problem that there is shared state, which would usually hinder uh, the possibility of scale, scaling out. If that solves the problem, fine. Okay, thank you. Don't you have to deal with the problem. Any more questions? Okay, I think we have a 10 minute break and then commence with the uh, address.